Uh, we'll call the uh, Sunderland School Committee meeting to order at uh, 5 p.m. on June 7th. And then I'm going to hand it over to Darius for the, the reorganization. All right, sorry, I was just getting the YouTube going. All right. And I got to get this thing recorded. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, no worries. I do that again for the record. Is it recording? I'm sorry, they just changed this is the update and record meeting. Recording. Okay. Okay. I guess it's recording. It's recording on, on YouTube, so we'll get it somewhere. Outstanding. <clears throat> All right. I'd like to call the uh, Sunderland Elementary School Committee meeting to order at 5.01 p.m. on uh, on June 7th, 2021. And All right. It's going to be super fast. I'm going to hand it over to Darius, uh, and we're going to reorganize the uh, the committee. Excellent. So that's where we are. Number first thing on the agenda is reorganizations. So I will be taking nominations for chair. I'd like to nominate uh, Greg Gottschalk for chair. Second. Any other nom other nominations? Closing nominations. All those in favor for Greg Gottschalk to be chair. Jessica, Megan, Peter, you're all waving, and Keith, you're all waved. So we'll do the visual wave. Yep. Greg, you are now chair, so I now hand the meeting back over to you. <laughs> Bill, Bill, vice chair, secretary, and frontier rep. Outstanding. All right, let's uh, let's start with vice chair. Uh, I'd like to nominate Jessica Corwin for vice chair. Second. Any other nominations? All right. In that case, uh, all in favor? Yay. All right. Jessica's vice chair. All right. Let's see. Now we've got the uh, secretary and frontier representative. Any nominations for secretary? I'll nominate Peter. Who's been doing our minutes <laughs> anyway? He has been. Second, oh, that one. Yeah. All right. Any other nominations? All right. All in favor? Peter voted for himself. He must be okay with it. <laughs> okay. Uh, frontier representative. Hey, is good, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Over time. Uh, frontier representative. Is that? Uh... I'll nominate Keith. I'll second. Okay. Any other nominations? All right. All in favor? All right. Outstanding. Um, I see on the list also there are things like Union 38 yep. representative, school council. We're going to go through all that too. You do all those as well. So you need Union 38 good. reps. Yep. Next one. We need Union three. 38 reps. And we, we need three of them all day, I believe. All right. Um, I don't know. Let's, let's talk. Interest? Yeah, Jessica's, Jessica's up for it. I'll nominate Jessica. Need a, a second. I'll second Jessica. All right, let's, we need a couple more. Can I nominate Megan? Yeah, I. Sure. Some of these things are new for me, so I imagine you'll let me know what all that means. But yes. Okay. When we have joint meetings, um, and each school committee for the elementary school level gets three votes because I think it's Waitley only has three members on their committee, so you'd be one of our three. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> I think the main thing is that you generally will tend to show up because, you know, sometimes they're concerned about getting a quorum. So, right. Yes. And, and 
does it matter or does it make a difference if we want our chair to be one of those three votes? Yeah, I was going to nominate Greg for uh, one of the, the third one. All right. Second. Second. Okay, can we get a second on Megan? I'll, I'll second Megan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. I didn't mean to do myself. <laughs> can we do it as a group? As we'll, we'll vote all three. Uh, so the the voting representatives for the Union 38 would be uh, Megan, Jessica, and Greg. All in favor? Aye. All right, unanimous. Life is good. School council liaison. I'm willing to do it if nobody else wants to. Awesome. Hmm. I nominate Jessica. <laughs> I second. Okay. Any other nominations? All right. All in favor? All right. The collaborative liaison. I'll nominate Keith. <laughs> <laughs> I'll second. He didn't object. <laughs> yeah. It would be a pleasure. Oh, outstanding. All right. Uh, any other nominations? All right. In that case, all in favor? Keith for uh, collaborative liaison. Unanimous. Brings us to negotiations team. Um, that's a fairly heavy time commitment during the day and i've done it in the past i'm a little worried that uh, i'm gonna looking at a work situation that may require some travel that might be incompatible with that schedule so i don't know if there's anyone else with an interest in being on the negotiations team how about you Jeff? and it is and it is a negotiation year it is a negotiations year um even if i'm not our rep i would if if the negotiations terms permit it, I would like to caucus anyway. So I, I would like to be able to attend even if I'm not representing our committee. I think it might be easiest if you were the representative. That would be okay. I'm not Jessica for the negotiating team. I'll second. Any other nominations? All right. All in favor? All right. Again, unanimous. All right, so we, we have our team. All right, uh, on to review and approve the minutes. Any uh, any comments, corrections on the minutes? Uh, I'll make a motion to approve. Get a second? Second. Jessica seconds. All right, all in favor? Minutes approved. Outstanding. All right, and financial statements and warrants. So I guess Shelly, you're up. Okay, so I did email out the uh, expense reports and we're gonna talk, I'll try to go quickly so that we don't take too much time, but I'm gonna go through all of the revolving accounts as promised and sort of talk about an end of year wrap up, even though we're still in the process of things. Um, but warrant business first, there were eight warrants signed electronically, totaling $32,824.84. Um, so if you look closely at the expense reports uh, for the year to date, it was through May 31st. If you look to the last page, there was an available budget balance of 179,000, somewhere right around there. Um, so we had talked about a budget freeze earlier in the year. Uh, we were looking to save at least $90,000 for next year's budget. That was part of the reason we were keeping our increase down. Uh, and we are going to exceed that amount. Um, I don't want to put an exact figure on it at this point because there are still some expenses that are not in the database that we'll work on over the next few weeks. Um, purchasing at the school level is primarily done. I worked with Ben and Layla to make sure that any school needs were met so that we could get a, a better estimate of the bottom line. Um, but there's always some operational things, like there's some central office expenses that we bill in late June so that the towns capture all of those things. Um, so that 179 number there, that's the current available balance, that will change a little bit. But regardless, we're gonna have more than the 90,000. Um, so I think given Sunderland's financial 
picture um, in prior years and moving forward, we should take everything that we can and reclassify the school choice and save that money moving forward, especially since we just brought on a new teacher, um, which we have some extra school choice money from this year, like we talked about last meeting uh, from the special education increments, but it's just gonna help us out to help fund that position, not only for next year, but possibly even fully for the year after if we take that extra saving. So. Uh, that's my recommendation there, unless anyone objects to that approach. Uh, any questions before I keep going on revolving funds? No, okay. Um, and Peter did send some questions, as always. Thank you for that, because it you know gives me some time to process some of the things that I may have missed, either in my report or to dive deeper for you guys. So I'm going to kind of go through those as I present here as well. Um, Darius, do you want to share your screen so that people can see the charts? We usually do that, and I think I forgot to ask you. Um, so the first revolving fund that we're going to talk about is school choice. Uh, I'll wait for him to get that up before I keep going. There's a lot of info in here. It's a lot to process, so just stop me at any point if needed. You need the document, Darius, or you got it. Okay, so uh, looking at fiscal year 21, uh, we started the year with 322,000 roughly. Our projection was 230,000, uh, but because we have that increase of 90,000 in um, savings, our, our, our expenses are gonna be down and our revenue is up because of the special education increment claims. Uh, so you can see there are ending balances, you know, almost double what we plan, not quite, but pretty darn close to it. Instead of 231,000 at the end of the year, we're looking at just shy of 400,000. So I think that's a really good spot for us to be in. That does include the, uh, it's about 30,000 for that new teacher position that we were covering from school choice. Um, it also includes the 80,000 for the out of district placement that we know is a one time expenditure. Peter, you had asked about that as well. Um, so that's in there. Uh, all of the other expenses. Oh, go ahead. Just so I make sure I understand what you're saying there. When you say included, in included in which number are you talking about? I'm sorry, I jumped ahead to 22 already. I realized that as I was talking. Okay. That's so the 9,000 in savings is going to help support those other things. Right. Thank you. Um, so if we scroll down to 22, thank you. Okay, so we're starting the year with 399. Uh, revenue is anticipated at 325, and that's before special education increments. So I imagine, again, next year that that will go up um, by the time that we put our claims in. And this expense number, the 486, that includes the out-of-district placement and the new teacher hire. Um, so that out-of-district placement will come off in 23. Peter had asked about uh, recurring expenses in 22, whether or not there were other one-time expenses versus things that were going to stay on. Everything else outside of that out-of-district placement is salaries and wages. So unless we make a decision to move some salaries and wages off of school choice, which might be something that we want to consider, um, the 80000 will come off, but the expenses will remain consistent moving forward. Uh, but again, we will hopefully have some higher revenue and we're starting off the year almost $200,000 better than we thought we would. Um, so you can see we're still overexpending. We knew that that was going to be the case. So ending next year, my projection right now is about the same as where we thought we'd be this year. So I think we're in a good spot. We're using those savings to help offset some of our additional costs. Um, you know, I think it would be a good idea for us to start talking about, do we move an IA or a half of an IA, you know, each year for so many years so that we can build that reserve up to about one year's of revenue. Um, that's really best practice. But I still think considering all of the hardship that we've had, we're in a really good spot looking ahead to next year for school choice. Um, one other thing about that out of district placement, Peter had asked about transportation. The transportation costs for this student as they stand right now are minimal because mom is transporting the student to school. 
Um, so we're not paying for busing for him or van service. Uh, but that could change if the family situation changes. So, you know, it'll be good to make sure that we have some extra school choice funds uh, in the event that we do need to add transportation expense in there. But right now, according to uh, Karen Ferrandino, our special education director, she does not anticipate a need for additional transportation costs next year for that out of district placement. Um, I'm just looking at the other questions that came in about school choice. I think that covers everything there. Um, so school lunch, uh, we knew that we were going to have minimal revenue. Oh, go ahead, Keith. I don't know if this is the appropriate time if we want to go back, but like the the, the moving of an IA or teaching position or something like that. But um, like, what would be our game plan for that? Are we looking at like a, a three year? Like, where do we want to be, and how many positions are we talking about over how many years in order to get to where we want to be? So, if we're looking at wanting to save, let's say a hundred thousand dollars, because if we're looking at we want our year end to be close to our revenue. So say we want our, our year end to be about 300,000. So between 75 and $100,000 more we want in school choice. So you're looking at either one teacher or three IAs. So you could do a three year plan and we could move one IA per year for the next three years until we get to where we need to be. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're not adding any other expenses. That would have to be the thing is, you know, we're gonna have to be creative about where we spend. Um, I think this right now is premature because we're not actively in budget season, but I also think it's good for you guys to start thinking about and come fall when we start the preliminary budget discussions for 23 and moving forward, I would like us to map out that kind of a plan. Um, so six and one half dozen another, either we take one teacher and we divide up the salary over a three year span, or we plan on pulling three IAs off. Um, I think that that would be a good approach over three years. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, school lunch. Uh, our, our revenue has been much better since having students back in the building uh, in April and especially in May. Our numbers are looking to be pretty good. We're serving consistent meals. Um, and actually, it comes to turn out that the reimbursement cost is higher than our cost for school lunch. Um, so if someone were buying lunch at $3 a person, the reimbursement is $3.57 roughly. Um, and then there's some differentials that the state and the federal government adds in for being um, high needs population. But, you know, roughly we're looking at $3.57 per student versus $3. So the last month has been really helpful in increasing our revenues, um, but they're still significantly lower than they would be in a normal year. Um, and then our food and supply costs, you can see here, those haven't really changed. The food and supply obviously was lower, the less students that we had in the building, um, but we still are having to pay for them. Our revenue is not covering our expenditures year to date. We're 10,000 um, in the hole right now. So we, we could talk about moving um, some of those salaries and wages from this year onto the general fund to free up some money um, to, to support this account versus putting it all into school lunch. Um, but at the same time, you know, we could also decide next year if the program's not doing very well to use some school choice funds to support the school lunch program. So, you know, that kind of journal entry is probably not needed right now because if you scroll down a tiny bit more, Darius, we're still going to be in the positive. We only have about $13,000 left in that fund. Um, but looking ahead to next year, we're going to be in better shape. Um, kids right now we're expecting are going to be back in the building full time. Um, USDA has extended the free lunch program for next year for all students and for an entire school year. So we will have um, free breakfast and free lunch for everyone. And so we're looking at a projection based on the numbers from we used April and May for our assumptions of about 80,000 in revenue. Uh, and if you haven't figured out by now, I'm pretty conservative, so I do expect that that will increase, but I always try to err on the side of caution and make sure that we're not having a number that we can't actually reach here. Uh, so we're looking at about 80000 in revenue, 40000 expenses, leaving our end of year balance at 53000 And that expense only includes um, uh, the cost of goods. So food and supplies. We have moved all of the wages onto the ESSER grant for next year. Uh, we did that during the budget process. 
And so that will allow us to reserve any of our uh, positive income at the end of the year for fiscal year 23 when the grant is no longer available. Um, I think you had asked a question about this, Peter. Looking ahead to 23 of other things that might need to go back to the revolving fund. Um, you know, we two years ago, the food service director's salary was also paid from the school lunch fund. That was a change that you guys had made a couple years back. You know, we'll have to talk about that during the budget season. It's a small portion of his salary. I want to say six thousand dollars of his salary, I believe, is paid by Sunderland. Um, so it might be something we can continue to absorb in the budget like we're doing this year and leave that there since it more uh, is a shared administrative thing. Um, but going into 23, the hope is that we can get at least the salaries and wages back on and that our revenue will be higher. Um, we don't know yet that at that point if it'll be um, free or if we'll be going back to charging for lunches or not. But we'll be in a decent spot next year. I, I don't. Obviously, 53,000 isn't enough to cover everything that we need to pay for if we're talking about 40 to 50 in cost of goods plus salaries on top of it. Um, but we may have some other funding sources. ESSER 3 is coming into play. We did get the award amount for that. Uh, for Sunderland, I want to say it's 180,000 roughly that we'll be getting. Um, that can be used over three years. So we'll have a couple years to build this program back up. Or like I said, we could make that decision to take some of this year's savings and put the funds back into school school lunch. If you guys wanted to talk about that, I'm happy to discuss that further. Um, go ahead. For FY23, I mean, one way or another, we'll be still getting a chunk of revenue because either the, the free program will continue or we'll go back to the old model, which is it's free and reduced for certain students and the others pay their way. But, you know, it, uh, there's no reason that the, the the fund shouldn't be self-supporting and in, in it, sh it should be much closer to self-supporting i mean if we're looking at 53 at the end of the year say even in 23 we bring in 80 so you know we're not quite at 100 what 130 140 so um if we've got say 50,000 in expenses and 50,000 in wages we are we're going to be back in the positive Right, um, right. We do have to pay for part of that, uh, what's being replaced, the steamer. Um, part of that has to be paid for next year. I don't have that figure in here because Jeff's still getting the quote on that. So we'll have to cover that. And, you know, we should start working on a long-term plan for replacing that equipment with support from the town, obviously, if it's a capital expenditure that we want to request. But, you know, there are quite a few things that need to be done. So I, I think we're going to be in really good shape, Peter. I don't think it's something that we have to be concerned about. Um, but, you know, we're not going to be looking at, you know, seventy-five, eighty, a hundred thousand dollars of savings in that account, which we really shouldn't anyway. So All right. Um, no, I, I was just thinking that, you know, I had heard mention a few meetings ago, either from from you or from Jeff, that, you know, one of the things you wanted to do was to look at the various equipment in the in the kitchen that a lot of it is real old and 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 so, you know, we should just be, you know, moving ahead you know, perhaps slowly, but moving ahead with a plan for, okay, what is it we're going to have to do? Um, and then, you know, how do we get, you know, where does the funding come from? But we can't just sort of ignore it. I and agree. That, yeah. Any other school lunch questions? Okay. Keep going. What do we have next? Uh, early childhood, I think. Yes. Okay. So early childhood, uh, we had very limited revenue coming in this year, about $11,000. Uh, we had practically no expenses because we moved all of the salaries and wages off of there. So it's really just um, supplies and materials, some stipends, some, some planning things. Um, so our net income was gonna be about $1,000 and ending the year with a, just shy of $50,000. So to start 22. Um, the assumption here is that classrooms return to some normalcy in the fall for our preschool programs, looking at 56,000 in estimated revenue. Uh, that is with 19 students, uh, and that is a mix of some who are special education who either don't pay at all for services or they pay a portion of the services, and then some uh, full-paying tuition students in that program as well. 
Uh, we have everything except for $10,000 in expenses and wages on the ESSER grant next year, so our expenses are very low. Uh, so we're looking at a positive net income of 40000 with our end of year balance estimated at about 91000 um, I think that's a good spot for us to be in going into 23, you know, because that ESSER grant, while we may need to use some of the ESSER 3, ESSER 2 will be gone. Um, and hopefully we can move those wages back onto the revolving account and help build up that program again moving forward. Um, and then special education revolving. Uh, so start of the year, 26000 roughly, we have uh, tuition coming in of 60000 Expenses are exceeding by 5000 and our end of year balance, uh, 13169 Although that math does not seem, I think I have a typo there. I'll look at those numbers again, Peter, and um, get them back to you to update the minutes. Um, but ending the year in a positive balance. So the special education revolving account is another fund that we're going to have to look at moving forward, not necessarily for 22. Um, Darius, can you scroll down to the 22 projection? Um, so starting out at 13,000, same anticipated revenue, um, but our expenses are gonna be about 57,000. So we are having a positive net income, but only ending the year at 15,000. And the reason that this fund is on my mind right now is because I believe in fiscal year 24, this student that's in the program will age out. So if we do not bring in another tuition, um, over the next couple of years, we will have to talk about how the, at a minimum, the teacher salary is being paid for. Um, so similar to school choice and what we just talked about, Keith's question, you know, sort of mapping out a plan of how we're going to move those wages off of this fund and onto another funding source. Um, we have a few years to plan it out and, you know, things could change. We could bring in more tuition over the next couple of years. Um, but right now we are going to have to look at that moving forward and start planning for this as well. Uh, and I think that that sums it up. And that answered, uh, Peter, one of your last questions was, you know, only six months from now we'll be back in the building the budget. And, you know, these are the things that we're going to have to think about and start planning for. Uh, you know, ESSER 3 will be in play, so that will be helpful for us for a couple of years to help us make some of these transitions and continue to get through some of the hardship with these revolving funds. Um, but the special ed revolving and the school choice are definitely things we're going to need plans for moving forward. Otherwise, I think, you know, we're in a healthy shape. I think the general fund, especially with the addition of this teacher, um, granted, we have to figure out how to fully fund it. But, you know, I think we've done a good job between COVID money and um, adding this position of getting the school what it needs with technology. And, you know, we certainly didn't lack anything this year when it came to getting everything that we needed to make sure that we could meet the needs of our students. So we're grateful for town support and, and grant funding. Um, so I think we're in okay shape. My, my hope is next budget season is not gonna look so um, dire for Sunderland, but we'll cross the bridge when we get there. Outstanding. Yeah, I just, I look at this compared to what I was looking at a year ago. And it's just astonishing to me how much better situation we are than I could have ever imagined. Uh, and, you know, a year ago, I mean, it was like, okay, we're getting level funded from the town, you know, we're, how are we going to deal with this, so on and so forth. And now I'm looking at all the revolving funds and, you know, it may not be quite where we want to, but boy, they sure are a whole lot better situation. Uh, you said you gave an amount for Esther 3 and I missed it. How much was that again? I want to say it's about 187000 Which will be available for what period of time? Um, it starts with fiscal year 21 and ends in September of 24. Uh, so that's quite a long time. Out. Yeah. Okay. No, I mean, I just, again, I think that, that you and the whole administration here has done just an awesome job in, in terms of making all this work with, you know, and find getting the funding sources and so on so that, you know, we can run the school the way it's supposed to be run. And um, just, you know, I think it's great what you've done. Thanks. Indeed. All right. Any other questions for Shelly? All right. Um, I think the, we, we had some interest in public comment, but maybe uh, it's uh, rescheduled. I don't know if there's anyone. I, I, yeah, I received their email and they were through. 
um, wanting to speak this evening. So uh, unless there's any public online who would like to make a comment. All right. Uh, in that case, um, I understand we have to be careful with Shelly's time this evening because right. she's So Shelly has to go to a select board meeting um, up in Conway to deal with their, their building. A, what we're trying to do here as well, trying, they're updating their playground. Their town um, is working with the school to purchase those materials. So Shelly has to go there to straighten them out. Um, and I always say that sarcastically. Not really sarcastically. Um, so if we could do Shelly's business on in the next move things up to uh, to get her the information we need from her brain out, um, which would include, um, I would go to you know five C and D um, yep. is basically, and then and also talk about the personnel handbook since she is the uh, one who did ninety nine percent of the work on that. Fair enough. Uh, let's uh, let's jump to D because that feels like it's going to be a fairly straightforward uh, issue. Um, so this is the the vote on the uh, special education team leader position. Um, Peter, go ahead. Muted, Peter. Sorry. Um, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the hiring of a special education team leader um, immediately, or you may have already done it, but anyway. I'll second that motion. All right. Um, and I know that this has gotten a lot of discussion, uh, just to uh, keep it brief, uh, including at the, uh, the select board. Uh, I do feel like we've got really good communication and cooperation going with the town government. Uh, you know, they're helping us out with the uh, uh, retire, teacher retirements and, and other capital expense stuff. Uh, but uh, we also definitely want to have uh, really clear narratives around expectations for, you know, we've spent a lot of tonight talking about strategic use of school choice and carefully building up that uh, revolving choice budget not putting more onto it than than uh, absolutely necessary, but also the tension between our, our annual asks of the town and uh, and keeping that revolving fund uh, healthy. So uh, you know, just again, uh, it's a it's a tough narrative to keep track of, but uh, you know, uh, I just want to keep. Make sure that the tone is understood as friendly, uh, hammering out some details on, on a narrative that's complicated. All right. It, any other comments? Has this uh, already been hired? We're in the middle of interviews right now. Okay, great. All right. Uh, Peter? Yes. Megan? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Keith? Yes. Greg? Yes. Let's see. On to the uh, early release Friday gap care fee. Um, I know we received uh, a marked up version with some suggestions from other towns. You know, Greg, can we, can we swap and do the uh, personal handbook? Because that one shows the, the, just only because of that one, I get make sure we have all full attention on I'll be honest, the gap here, I know the numbers and I can fill in. Okay. I'll show you on that. If you don't mind. By all means. All right. The uh, revised non-union personnel handbook. Uh, Darius, do you want to share the summary of changes? Would that be helpful for everyone to see it? I did send it out, but it might just be good to have something to look at. <clears throat> so I think in, in, you know, one of my first months at the school, Darius and I had this conversation about sort of parking lot issues that he knew were coming to fruition and needed to be addressed. And, you know, I noticed some things off the get go when trying to familiarize myself with all of our different personnel policies and, and procedures. And one of the things that was very different was that um, the non union personnel, so um, the Union 38 non union personnel handbook. Uh, was very different than the Frontier non-union personnel handbook. So we're talking about secretaries, custodians, cafeteria staff, um, aides that might help in library or classroom, people that don't fall under the teacher's union, 
um, or the IA Unit C contract. So it was on our radar to modify, get everybody in alignment. Um, while the jobs are very different between the elementary school and Frontier in a lot of ways because of volume and the things that the secretaries are doing, um, they're also similar in a lot of ways. And there was a lot of inequities between the positions. So we went through the handbook and consolidated. Um, Frontier was a lot more complicated and complex than uh, Union 38. It had uh, all different positions mapped out and, and it was really kind of built for specific people. So we tried to streamline that so that instead of thinking, okay, this is, I'm gonna use Donna Hathaway as an example, this is Donna Hathaway's position. It was more, um, let's get it in line for, these are either 10 month employees that work during the school year or 12 month employees that work year round. Uh, so just to help with some of the classification and, and bring things more into balance for like positions. Um, so that was the first step was fixing up the job classifications. Uh, and there is job classification 10 month, 10 month plus, and then 12 month. And that 10 month plus is, uh, for example, some of the, I'm gonna use guidance at Frontier because I know that I believe it happens with that role. Uh, she works maybe five extra days at the beginning of the school year before kids come back and five at the end of the school year when kids leave. Um, so that's where the 10 month plus comes from in the new uh, revised handbook. Um, anyone that might work a couple of extra days on either end. Um, so the other thing that we did was update all of our hiring requirements. Uh, there were new policies that were added that each employee has to sign off on when they're hired and annually uh, Donna Hathaway sends out so that we all are in compliance with those policies, sexual harassment, the anti-discrimination, um, confidentiality, those kind of things. And then the fingerprinting outlines, that's something new in the last few years that is now required upon hire and that was not put in the handbook with the last update. So those pieces are in there. Um, Juneteenth was added as a holiday, which I know is, you know, with approval of school committees, that's a separate discussion, but we did put it in here assuming that that will get passed. Um, and then one of the biggest things was updating vacation and sick time. So for whatever reason, Union 38 employees could not roll over any of their vacation or sick time. They were losing their vacation. So if the secretary had five days left on June 30th, that was absorbed back. She was not able to use that time moving forward. Whereas frontier secretaries in a like position were able to carry over into the new year up to five days. And so it, it felt unfair to Union 38 employees that they weren't receiving that same benefit. And we also didn't want to take it away from the frontier staff. Um, administrators are also able to take advantage of that rollover if we'd like to. So to make it more equitable, we streamlined that and everyone can um, roll over five days. Uh, Union 38 employees previously needed to work 30 hours a week to be eligible for vacation time, but Frontier, it was 20 hours per week. So again, went with the better policy there so that our part-time employees would be eligible for vacation time. And where that comes up really, where I've seen it the most, is probably part-time custodial staff. Um, even though they only work 20 hours a week, they're still working 12 months a year and they're they're just as valuable in the building as the 40 hour a week employees. So we wanted to make that equitable for them as well. Um, one of the other differences is that uh, Union 38 employees were receiving less vacation time. Darius, can you scroll down a tiny bit? They were receiving less vacation time than Frontier employees. So you can see here after one year of service, Union was getting five um, after three years, 10, after five years, 15. So we've made that in alignment with Frontier. Um, but honestly, uh, what's happening with a lot of our new hires is that it, we started this at Frontier and I think it would also happen at Union 38, especially with this new handbook, that if somebody comes in with professional experience of a similar position, we're giving them credit for their years of service in a like industry. Um, it's really difficult to hire anyone as a professional with no vacation time. It's not attractive to leave where you are currently to come into a role with zero vacation. So, you know, we've sort of already been making those decisions independently, but wanted to get that in, in writing here. Um, so I think that that sums up the vacation. If you scroll down, any questions yet? 
Okay. Um, so sick time, uh, it was similar differences, you know, that things weren't matching up. Um, union employees weren't accumulating as much time as frontier employees were. Um, they weren't getting as much sick time up front. For example, uh, frontier custodians were getting 10 sick days and union were only getting five. Um, and actually this became really complicated this year in particular when there was a part-time Conway employee who wanted to apply for a part-time frontier position. And when he did that, the vacation time and the sick time was not the same. So it was really complicated. Uh, to work out not only internally for tracking purposes, but it was hard for him as an employee to understand. So again, make that consistent with like um, positions across the board. Um, so everyone will be on the same. If you're 10 months, you're getting uh, the 10 days. If you're 12 months, um, you're getting, uh, what does it have on here? Oh, it doesn't have the amount. I think because the accumulation was different. Um, so that's the sick time benefit. And then longevity, uh, we updated again to match Frontier. Uh, there was only, for Union 38 employees, um, a $250 longevity bonus after 10 years, and Frontier had a 10, a 15, and a 20. So we've added that so that union employees that are in like positions are receiving the same amount. Um, big change across the board for everyone, uh, which, similar to the teacher contracts and the IA contracts doesn't impact anyone who's currently hired because they will be grandfathered in. But the way that the sick buyback works right now is that um, any non-union personnel, so secretary, custodian, uh, cafeteria worker, um, they can get two days of vacation per year of service upon retirement. Um, and Darius and I would like to recommend a cap for that for any new hires that are coming in as of July 1st um, so that it's capped at 45 days. Um, you know, we've, we talk a lot about needing to update the teacher contract so that it's more um, in alignment with the market and that we're not having these significant payouts. And while the retirements are um, less for this population, you know, there's not as many people that stay on through the longevity of their career. Um, but there have been several in the past few years that, you know, received payouts of thirty, thirty-five thousand dollars And it's split up a lot of times because they tend to be, you know, they could be central office personnel um, that retire. But if it was a custodian that's been with you for 30 years and, and they're at the highest um, step on that salary schedule, uh, you know, you could be looking at a significant payout. So we thought it was best. And this, I believe, Darius, is in alignment, the 45-day payout with the IA uh, language. Um, and IAs are obviously on an hourly salary schedule like these people, so it felt equitable to um, have similar language in there. Um, and as you can see, the, the Frontier and the Union um, agreement were different. Frontier was two days and Union was only one and a half days per year of service. So trying to get everybody um, in alignment here. I don't. I think that was the last piece. Is there anything else after that? I think retirement was less. Um, we wanted to go through and do track changes for you, but it was getting really complicated because there was so many changes, even with just formatting and realigning the, the job classifications. So, you know, if you did take the time to go through it and you caught something that we missed in this summary, please let me know because it's important to point it all out. And I don't think it's been updated in quite a few years, um, maybe 2018 or one of them was 2014. I can't remember if it was Union or Frontier, but it's been it's been a long while and really needed some attention. So I'm happy to take questions if you have them. And we are looking for you, um, not necessarily to adopt tonight, but this would be right, Darius, first reading, and then we would adopt in September. Um, although we're looking to go retroactively back to July one, correct? Yes. And I, also, I, and Ben, correct me if I'm wrong, this, you know, it, it talks about all these employees, but we're I think we're talking about three, right? In my, in my, in my head, I'm thinking it through. Um, is this, in, this is including cafeteria staff as well? Yes. Yeah, so, so you're right. So that's five. We're talking about five, five employees now? Five. So it's five employees. I know it's a lot of wording for that, but it's, you know, <laughs> it's. District wide, it's district a lot wide. more. Employees. District wide is a lot more, but it is. Um, yeah. Jessica, you had something? Uh, yeah, first of all, Shelly, thank you. I found that document really easy to follow on my own <laughs> when you sent it out in advance. I loved the formatting. Um, 
just was wondering, um, for my own my own clarity, do we now have a single unified handbook for non-union at, the, at both levels? Okay, we've we've merged. All right, thanks. I wanted to know that. And the problem with the what happened over time is that you've had people in certain positions that we didn't even call them the positions. We call the position by the person's name. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, that's you know that's Shelley's position. You know, and so it you know we need to have. Um, that kind of thing. It is a movement that has 38 acting as one district versus town employees. So someone could kind of come in and say, you know, we're doing something separate for these non-union people. We have a union seat based on the collective bargaining units of our teachers and IAs. But, you know, there's this group of people that are lost. And I think it's our job to take care of them and treat them equitably. So if we disagree with points of this, that's fine. But I do think we need to make sure that we have one simple thing that we're treating everybody fairly um, because people were just these ones, these singleton positions start to get messy as you hire different people um, as time goes on. So, Peter, um, shall we? Any sense, or I don't know if you looked into uh, comparable um, uh, procedures at other area school districts? See where, how this would tie, you know, would be similar or if we're, you know, out on a limb by ourselves. No, I don't think we're out on a limb. Um, I did reach out to other districts. Some other districts have unions for these types of folks, which we don't. So those were not apples to apples, although you know, similar to an IA contract, a lot of this policy is similar to the IA contract. Um, I did look at uh, our towns to see what their policies and procedures were. And you know, I think we're pretty much in alignment with them. Um, you know, they don't necessarily have the retirement payout that we do. Um, but I think we're we're similar. And we also looked at the pay scales of of not every single position, but like positions in in the districts as well to see to see if our charts were in, we're again um, middle mid mid upper mid on some positions, middle on other positions. Right, yeah. Shelley? Yeah. My favorite. Yep. Yeah. Would it? Would it help if we voted on this tonight? I don't, if you're ready to, unless there's a reason legally not to, then you could. I think you have the right to read through, right? And then wait till your next meeting to actually vote. Well, I only say this because you send this stuff out in advance. So it's not like it just been dropped on us. And, you know, I think that that is great for just committee efficiency and committee actually sort of reading documents and, um, so I, I don't know what the other committee members feel. I'd be willing to vote tonight, but I don't want to push it. Yeah. If you would do so, this is considered, I guess, a policy. So you'd vote to waive your policy on um, a two a two reading, and you vote that, and then you then vote the subject. So you got to vote to waive your policy for this subject for this vote, and then you vote the subject. Just that, just that, that's the proper procedure on that. <laughs> Do we just play by the old procedure? I mean, I don't know. That gets more. No, it's fine. You just say you you make a motion to waive the two reading policy. Jessica seconds it. Everybody says aye. Then you go. I vote move to you know pass the um, you know being as presented. Someone seconds it, and you go aye. You're done in thirty seconds. Okay. So why don't you why don't you give me the wording here, Darius, and then I'll actually. Um, I move to waive the two reading policy. Yeah. For the employee handbook, vote, and uh -huh. then someone seconds it. I'll second. That this just means you're all in agreement that you don't need it, and that way you're not okay, so shortchanging someone who's not, you know, in agreement. So, so the motion is to waive the two reading policy, and then we'll have the motion to actually vote will be a separate motion. Okay, so we've got the first one, which I will make just the way Darius said it, and Jessica has seconded. Actually, Megan seconded. Megan seconded. Awesome. Keith, are you going to say something? Yeah, normally I like the two reading just mostly for public, but in this one where it's going to be, we're going to be voting on it retroactively anyway, it makes sense to, to get this in before we hit that date anyway. I feel the same way. All right, well, unless there's further discussion, uh, let's see, Megan? Do we need to? Oh. Uh, that's good. <laughs> yes. Peter. 
Yes. Keith? Yes. Greg, yes. All right. The motion or the policy is waived. Okay. And then I'll make a motion to approve the uh, revision union personnel handbook. I'll second. All right. Uh, Peter? Yes. Keith? Yes. Megan? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Greg? Yes. All right. So it's approved. Thank you. Indeed. I see on the agenda, too. Let's see. Uh, okay. So do we want to go to the team leader position now? So basically, you voted the team leader position already. And what happens, yeah. it was posted both under new business and under old business. Sorry. Yeah, because yeah. I said it. Yeah. I told Donna that we got to vote the youth school choice fund. So she put it on there. Yeah. And then went in both places because we were continuing a discussion. And I, I misspoke. I meant the, the gap care. Yes, you can go there. All right, time to jump on the early like Friday gap care. Oh, yeah. So it, um, I don't know if any if we want to share it or the uh, I suppose Darius. We've got the two suggestions from uh, Waitley and Deerfield. I'll share my screen again to go the details of it and we can have a discussion about where we're at. Um, um, so basically we're talking about the gap care on the Friday of professional development. You guys kind of all know the thing, but here that, you know, for a $5 fee between 130 and three, and the two changes were the fee would not apply to families who are already enrolled in after school program. So we're not adding additional money onto that afternoon rate for them. Um, and that children, multiple children of a family would be 250 for each additional child. Um, so, you know, I think in presenting of this, again, um, I've had you know some side conversations with people about this as well. Between this and that, you know, this is not something that you know I'm falling on the sword on. That would you know be like, oh man, you know, you, you really need to do this. I just think it is an opportunity to make this adjustment in this, and I do understand that each community has to look at this. Um, it is basically each. I'm, you know, I brought it to it this way in each community because it's different by community and. Um, you know, what we want to provide for families and what we want to charge for families. So. And I know we, we didn't get input from the community. I'm sorry. I said, I know we did get some, some input from the community. Okay. Um, so I didn't know. Uh, I, there's questions about uh, should how do we handle uh, which you know people with scholarships? Whether that's something that uh, can be rolled in, um, people who are already receiving, say, free and reduced lunch, need not apply, kind of stuff. Ben, do you want to kind of talk about how you do that now with other financial um, those families? I mean, it's not those, for the most part. We know who those families are. Um, Ben? Yeah, typically with um, past similar situations, we've ex extended those scholarships to those families that are either receiving free or reduced lunch. Um, and then, you know, if, if families come to us with hardships, we, we honor that as well. And that's, that's pretty much it. Fair enough. All right. Um, go ahead, Keith. Just so for the sake of like having an idea of the full picture. So it would not be anybody who's already, um, in the after school program. Um, we're going to be cutting it. You know, if you would only apply, they're not enrolled, split in half. If there's multiple children, if there's hardship in scholarship, I'm just asking 
is it actually, are we going to generate a revenue enough to actually make an impact? You know, um, it's a good question. So, you know, in, um, I had a conversation with someone about this as well. It's not the revenue alone that we're trying to do here. And, and I, I'm sorry, I did this for, had four different conversations on this, so I forget where we went in our last one. But um, to to have a fee, whether or not some of the economists out there agree or not, Jessica, um, when you have a fee, it sometimes slows people from just having the kids stay through to three and I'll just pick them up. It's still the same length of the school day because there is no barrier to having the kids stay through. When you have a fee, people second, you know, will second guess whether or not they should be, they want to pay five dollars to have their kids do, you know, um, you know, what originally, you remember, I, we did talk about originally there was a lot of these enhancement things and that kind of has kind of been reduced to special events. Um, but it's a lot of just free play time that's actually happening during that time period. And so by charging a fee that that number we we believe will come down and at the same time um, give us extra revenue to do these extra, put in extra staff and you know, provide snack and that kind of thing. So it's a little bit of a win, win there. So that is the, that's one of the, I'm not hiding that motivation. And also, um, honestly, the free up staffing, if the numbers go down for professional development, because usually um, it's staffed by instructional assistants. <clears throat> and in some of our schools, it takes um, all of the IAs that are, part of the, the school to um, provide duty coverage, which means the IAs aren't receiving uh, PD on those days. Was that something that we could explain on the payment form? Because I think that there may be some families for whom the $5 is not a deterrent, but if you explain the impact on the rest of the community, they might say, yeah, you know, I could take my kid home at 1.30. Can we just at some point make that clear to the community that that impacts BIAs and the professional development um, and the, the impact that the professional development has in classrooms. Yes, I think we can do that. Yeah, it sounds like Jessica, you've had some conversations with Darius about, uh, I, I wanna say, I think it was Dan Ariely. Uh, there's a, a famous case study of a preschool in Israel where the, you know, you know what I'm talking about? Kids, yeah. Basically, uh, parents were picking up the kids late. And so to discourage that, the school started charging a fee for late pickup. And what happened is the number of parents who came late increased and they came later because, oh, it's a service for fee. And they said, oh, this is a terrible idea. So they said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to start charging again, or we're going to make it free, right? Try to go back to the way it was. And then even more people did it because, oh, it was a service and now it's free. So it's it's one of those games we got to be really careful, uh, but it, it's not a bad idea I think to explain, yeah, you know, while we're doing this. So what's what's say? I can go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to add my opinion because we utilize that out of school time as a family, <clears throat> and when I, you know, when you guys were talking about the fee for that, you know, in my mind, if I have to find childcare, it costs. 17 plus dollars an hour. And so that seems extremely reasonable to me, but I obviously and don't speak on behalf. Well, I mean, I do, but like everybody's family situation is very different, but just thought I'd add that. Keith? I, I was just gonna say, um, uh, uh, make a motion to approve the early release, early release Friday gap care fee. All second. Any further discussion? All right, Jessica. Yes. Peter. Yes. Megan. Yes. Keith. Yes. Greg. Yes. All right, unanimous. Well, I guess if there's any UMass economics PhD candidates, they can come study, see what happens here. <laughs> It could be a famous report somewhere. <laughs> I'm going to jump off for Conway. Thank you, Shelly. See you all in September, right? Shelly. Well, that's where we thought at this time last year. <laughs> I all right. Be, take care. See you. Bye.
she better not just jinx that. Yeah. Well. Do we have anyone who's going to give us uh, an anti-racism equity subcommittee update? Um, we do not. Um, they there really has been no real movement since the last one. They did have their full committee meeting. I told them, you guys a quick thirty second whatever overview. Um, as you know, they attended that meeting as well. The you know um, we they walked away with focus for next year is focusing more on communication. Um, they talked a little bit about the different ways they wanted to communicate out which they had planned to this year and never um, weren't able to get there. And also make sure we build up sustainability of our um, our work moving forward through next year. So a lot of momentum going into, ne into last year and be able to carry that forward. So those are the two major themes from there. Um, you know, the a lot of the planning of stuff has been taken over um, as you saw in the reports that Sarah and Kim gave at the joint meeting. So you'll see that, you'll see it coming up pretty regularly next year as well. So. That's there. That's what Kelsey told me to tell you. Outstanding. Thank you. All right. In that case, uh, COVID nineteen update and summer planning. Very, very um, short. There, obviously, we're still keeping on there because COVID is still still around. Um, right now, we're you know with we're, with the summer programs, the DESI guidance um, came out, and then they came back out a few weeks later and changed it. Um, there's been some political. Uh, union and other kind of political pushback on the masks being removed from teachers in the buildings during the summer. So they did do a release that said that vaccinated adults in the building do not during summer classes, do not have to wear masks. Um, and then they came out and said, now they do inside the building for a summer pro pro program. So we're kind of doing a wait and see before the summer programs pop, pop up, but that's where we are right now. Um, Cause we didn't know it was kind of this back and forth. We didn't know if there's going to be a, with the new heat and that kind of stuff, and you know, there's gonna be a pushback the other way as the politics are getting played out. But um, you know, we are running full forward with our summer programs. A lot of it will be outdoors. It'll be just like we're doing now, school. Um, a mirror image, you know, mask will be indoors. Um, when adults aren't working with students, they can they can be mask free if they're vaccinated indoors. So we'll be following all of those those guidelines. Um, mask free option. You can still wear them if they want to. That's kind of where we are within COVID. Next year, you know, I got a letter in draft. I'm going to get ready to close the year off to families. But um, I don't know what masks are going to be like for, for students starting up the year. I imagine we're going to see a lot, something similar to where we finish the year. But um, we're going to wait for guidance to come out um, from DESI. A lot can change in two months in any direction. So um, there's no set way that we were opening up next year because they're going to change it. And so we're just going to be ready to open up next year. The way we left it this year, at least, if not, and then I'll modify from there. And that's a good segue into: Are we we're voting the uh, updated face covering policy? Yes. Um, so, our, as you know, I changed on the fly. We, you know, we kind of knew I went and I kind of notified you that I was changing it to the outdoors, um, and so I updated the one where. Um, crossed out on school grounds and when appropriate distance is enforced um, during breaks outside um, eating and drinking. Um, I did send out a additional one that was very, um, Amherst passed a very simple mask policy that kind of stopped the back and forth with school committee and basically said, we're gonna follow whatever the state dishes out at this point for mask policies. I put that out in time for you guys to look at if you wanted to change the policy to that moving forward, or if you would like to, you know, I can go either way, but it just kind of, it basically says we're gonna stop trying to do things different than the state is what they were talking about. And I said, that's an interesting philosophy at this point in the pandemic. You always could, you always could yeah, yeah. You know, jump back up and rescind it and, and do something else. But they're basically saying, you know, Darius just, you know, what that one would be saying is Darius just follow what the state says, moving forward. you know, but that's up for you. Um, because I put that out there as an option as well. Jessica? Uh, I know that DESI is under pressure from, from some parents to get rid of masks, including for elementary age kids who are not yet eligible for vaccination. I don't know what DESI is going to do. I don't fully trust that they will say unvaccinated children should remain masked. So I'm, I'm not comfortable rolling the dice and saying we'll just automatically do whatever DESI says. They, they had parents make a demonstration at the at the board meeting a week or two ago.
All right. Any other thoughts? Go ahead, Peter. So if we just stay with the policy, we can, we have the option of just staying with the existing. You would um, just amend the amend the current policy to, yeah. to, uh, to, to allow outdoor masks, which we are currently doing. Outdoor, no masks, sorry. Yeah, outdoor, mask-free. So the, the red line that went around with the uh, EBCFA. That one. <laughs> sorry, that's not helpful at all. Okay. So do we need a vote? Do we need a vote on that? I think so. Yeah. I'll make a motion to uh, endorse the uh, the marked up uh, EBCFA, including the on school grounds and the uh, when appropriate social distancing invoice struck out. I'll second. All right. Megan. Yes. Keith. Uh, yes. Peter? Jessica? Yes. Greg, yes. All right. And I think that brings us to the Juneteenth holiday. All right. So let me present that. I normally have all my screens pre opened, and so I apologize there, but. I had to run my kid home and back, you know, my hardships here. All right, present. And I'm gonna to turn to my other screen to see your faces. So if I'm giving you the side of my ear, that's that's what you're that's why it's doing that. So that I can present and also see you. All right, so um the Juneteenth holiday proposal. Um Right now, we, we have it as part of the handbook that you just approved. Um, but basically, we're looking to start it next year to be eligible for a paid holiday because everything was starting July 1 on that um, on that update. The um, Juneteenth will be changed the same as other fall days. It falls on a Saturday, they get the Friday off. It falls on a Sunday, you get the Monday off. Um, and then also, we would be bringing this forward to be so that would be all the 12 month employees, 10 month employees um, are bargained for the most part. You know, that's kind of, a there is a, maybe one or two out there that aren't, um, but you know, that could be part of the bargain. I imagine that we're gonna probably include that as part of our, you know, wanting to um, put that um, paid holiday on that for unit C. The teachers don't get paid holidays, so it's not relative there. And if the school is happening during that time, it is a state holiday, so school would be closed. So, um, whoop, I forgot I was presenting. <laughs> um, the, uh, so that's kind of basically, um, we kind of pulled it out because what it would also require is that we have non-union administrators. Um, that basically would this would add to their paid holidays as well. It doesn't increase their pay, it just gives them the day off um, working that day. But we'd have to amend like Ben's contract to give him the Juneteenth as well. Um, and again, I'm thinking this all starting next year um, because this year it falls on a Saturday um, and, and such. So, <clears throat> Quite frankly, Ben has doesn't have enough time to use all his days off as it is. <laughs> Sorry, Ben. <laughs> all right. Any discussion? Jessica, go ahead. Uh, just a very quick question. I'm sorry, I froze for a minute there, so this may have already been discussed. Um, is Unit A teachers and Unit C is IAs? Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, yes. Unit okay. C is the IAs. Um, they don't get paid holidays. The teachers do not get paid holidays. They get a contracted year. One could say they're paid holidays, depending if you want. They're mixed up that way, but that's not the way the contract's written. <clears throat> Is there? Does this bind us to the Saturday becomes a Friday and Sunday becomes a Monday? Could there be any flexibility if it if it interacts with where the last day of school falls? If we could make the last day of school a Friday instead of a half day the following Monday, could we have that flexibility? 
So you're saying if the 19th was on a Friday and that was the last day of school, would we have to go to Monday and we could we swap that out? Well, if, if it falls on Friday, that having it on the actual day makes sense to me. But what if it falls on Saturday? Could we observe it the following Monday so that we're not? Oh, interesting. Interesting. Um, or if it falls on Sunday and the last day, could could we put a Sunday ob observance on Friday so that Monday, Tuesday is not a one day week if the last day was going to, I don't know. <laughs> Does this policy it, bind us to? It really is, a, yeah, the, the timing to the school schedule this isn't, um, isn't helpful in that it, it, it is a lot of the school year ends usually between the 18th and the 22nd is the normal. Um, you know, we're starting and starting earlier to get out earlier, but um, you're right, Jessica, it's going to, I don't know, I, I could look ahead when you, you, know, you guys don't need to keep reading that, right? Um, could I we strike look, that, sec that section? <laughs> could we that? give you the flexibility? <laughs> You know what? Well, let me look into that, um, and we can update it. Yeah, Keith, you had something? Yeah, I agree with Jessica. It makes sense not to like extend a day to like the following week, especially right at the end. But are we? Do we have the ability to operate outside if it's a state holiday? Would they? Would the state require us to do it anyway, and then we'd have to make it up? It's a, it's a it's a good point. You know, I mean, is that you know, the, so the town employees, um, the towns are slowly um, adopting policies. This is, I think, Deerfield. I'm not sure if uh, someone has it on town meeting this year, but I talked with the administrators a few months ago about like let's get on the same page. And then it kind of got loose because it went to the towns and their different governorship. Um, but the towns are awarding this, are awarding it this way, but they don't have the school schedule like we do. You know. Um, but I think you're right, Keith. If, it, if that's the holiday, you can't suddenly move, you know, Labor Day weekend or the Fourth of Fourth of July. You know what I mean? You can't all say, "Hey," like, although we do it all the time with fireworks. Yeah. But it doesn't really work. Let's do it Saturday night instead. You know. Um, I, I mean, I just—it's a personal thing. I agree with Jessica. Nothing drives me up the wall more than like a last day is a half day on a Monday. Do we vote this for now and and? Figure that out later, or do we hold off voting on this till we figure it out? If there's nothing happening this year because of the Saturday, the way it falls, there's no legal requirement to do that. Some people are just pushing it forward for this year. Um, we're kind of in a weird, and I say this, and Ben, you can give me your, you can give your two cents on this. You don't have to agree with me, but non-union employees have a lot of vacation times they had to burn up i actually had a request you know they had a we had so many that were carrying over that we had to work out different things with different people so that we didn't have all this accrued sick time because people canceled vacations due to covid and they just worked instead and then last summer was remember it was hell on wheels so it was just we you know administrators didn't take vacations in october august like they used to um or like they should have you know so um, people have a lot of time. So I, I don't think it's as crucial this year as in the day, but there is the, the reason for the holiday too. You know, I hate to throw it out there. We're, we've done all this anti-racism work and then, you know, um, it's important for us to get that kind of squared away as well. Um, Go ahead, Keith. I think that we do have to honor the holiday. So I'd make a motion that we honor it. And then when we go to develop the school schedule, we have to be really aware of what, because whatever day we start on is going to affect that last day. So we can probably work it that way. So I would make a motion to accept. I'll second. All right. Uh, Megan? Yes. Peter? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Keith? Yes. Greg? Yes. All right. Let's see. That brings us to reports. Ben, have you got something for us? Yeah, first up, this is hot off the press that graduation, sixth grade graduation is being moved from tomorrow night to this coming Thursday, um, both due to the heat and then also it's since it's going to be an outside graduation this year with a chance of thunderstorms both tomorrow night and Wednesday night. Um, so it's going to be same time, 
530 out back um, under the tents directly behind the school. And I also wanted to take a moment to recognize a few of our long tenured faculty members who are moving on um, at the end of this year. First being our sixth grade teacher, Ellen Von Flatern. She actually retired in at the end of December, and um, but she is going to be recognized and honored at graduation coming up on Thursday night. Um, also, our longtime PE teacher, Heidi Jibo, is moving on to become the head of auxiliary auxiliary programming at the Stonely Burnham School. So we thank uh, Ms. Jibo for all that she did for our community. Um, mm -hmm. Our talented visual arts teacher, Ms. Rashat, is, um, as you know, she, or may or may not know, she splits time between both Deerfield and Sunderland. Um, Deerfield is expanding her role next year, and so she's going to be there for five days a week and is only going to have to uh, juggle one set of materials and one um, one classroom. So congrats to her on that. And then also our beloved school custodian, David Grace, has announced his retirement for the end of the school year. Um, Mr. Grace took so much pride in not only keeping our school clean, but supporting the SES staff as well. Uh, he had an incredible work ethic, and you know, this past year, as with everyone else, but he, he was faced with the toughest challenge of his career. Um, cleaning, disinfecting, and sanitizing pro, uh, protocols were immense. Um, as usual, he rose to the occasion and helped us keep our doors open throughout the year. So we're really appreciative of all the time and effort he put into our school, and he will truly be missed. So for... Um, phenomenal people that uh, are moving on to the next step in their in their lives. So we thank them. Indeed. Many thanks. All right. Um, Darius, do you have anything else? Peter? Nope. I, yeah, I got a question for Darius, and that is, um, uh, it seems to me we still got hanging out there the question of your evaluation or did we do something and i just missed it that is in the, the hands of the chairs who collected the evaluation so you guys have you guys have done it it's gone to them and so i don't know what the uh what the plan is i mean i i just happen to think evaluations are important and um we you know we we we, we need to have a process that that gets it done each year in a timely way. And and I don't know if that means to be thinking now about how it might be different next year. And I mean, both wrapping up this year is one because I think that needs, you know, we, that's that's important. And then also thinking ahead is a different way. <coughs> Excuse me, is there a different way we should be doing it? Yeah, I wonder if we should move the joint meeting to May. Because April's so close to budget season, anyways, that we may, you know, um, and then do the joint meeting. Then I mean, you can need a joint meeting to evaluate me, because um, it's kind of, you know, I don't know. You have one committee doing one thing, one doing that. I guess suppose you could, um, but that's probably ide you know, ideally, would you have to do a joint meeting? Um, there's a part of me that's like, you're right, evaluation's important. There's also a part of me like, I don't want to drag everybody out to have a meeting of a joint meeting just to evaluate me, um, you know, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, especially it's bad. No, I'm just joking. Um, hopefully I'm joking. But you know what I'm saying? So I, there's a part of that kind of, you know, it's been a long year. I mean, I mean, also part of what I'm thinking about is, you know, I've sat at a couple of select board meetings where they talk about, you know, they've 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 upped the wages of a number of town employees who were chronically underpaid. Um, but then the, you know, tied in with that is the discussion of, well, in the future, you know, are we are we doing the evaluations because do people just automatically keep getting, you know, good raises or are they, you know, expecting, you know, good employees? And and so evaluations are important. And and the way the school committee's set up in our power is we only evaluate one person. But I guess, my, you know, part of my question is also is our evaluations, you know, down through your whole system, are they being done the way they're supposed to be done on a schedule they're supposed to be done on? You know, principals, are you evaluating the principals on a timely basis or, you know, various, all the various employees getting evaluated and getting feedback in terms of, you know, 
the job they're doing. Right. So just to go to start, the, the evaluations of, of myself, you guys did actually the best um, percentage of evaluation that was has been done in, in recent memory. So I think it's 19 of the 25 members did an evaluation. Um, at least that's what I heard at the last that was submitted to um, Bob and Ken to then take it. That's why I said so it's been done. The, the information has been collected. They just haven't summarized it and moved it forward on something. So, um, you know, as far as evaluations all the way through, it's it's um, it's up and down. Like last year, you know, evaluations were not done at the end of the last year, um, you know, with principals and such. But I have to get on those. Um, you know, teacher evaluations are done. Um, principals are held accountable to that, and you know, contractually as well. So, you know, we could do more evaluations on the upper um, administrators. You know, so being blunt, blunt question, blunt answer. <clears throat> I mean, I thought. <laughs> If, if we don't take your evaluation seriously, it's sort of, you know, implies to me a message that we don't think evaluations are important. And, and I just want to say that I think they are the feedback. I mean, it's it's like, you know, giving what I hope is positive feedback about how people can be improving what they're doing is to me an important part of, of management. And, yeah, I, I have mixed reviews on in the sense of this should be this is having a blunt, an honest conversation because my evaluation is public. It's like, you know, you can say, Darius, you're doing great, but I want you to do this. You know, people print, I want you to do this. You know what I mean? Unfortunately, that kind of thing. So, I, you know, I always say to the school committee, let me know, you know, professional development me and give me feedback as the year goes on. You know, um, just, you know, this is one of the things where I think it's kind of, you know, you know, if you said, you know, Darius, you stink at this. That's what the paper's in print. You know, what I mean, so that's why I think it's just kind of unfair, you know, within the how the evaluation's done. Like it should be the overall should certainly be public about what's going on. But you know, I think comments of which you know areas you want me to improve on or that kind of stuff. I don't. I just a little bit, you know, I mean, I'm sensitive to that a little bit. You know, you get, you know, I don't. I'm just kind of giving you my kind of blunt. That's why I say if you think I'm, you know, and I've had school committee members, you know, current school committee members, you know, pull me aside after a meeting and say, you know what. You know, I didn't like the way they handled this or, you know, in the future, can we do it this way? You know, that kind of thing. And it's not, you know, it could be something that should be an evaluation, but it's not, you know what I mean? So it's a balanced approach. Yeah, I'm just giving you my honest feedback. I think it's not a, I don't know, it's kind of a, it's, a, it's an, un, it's not a really fair system to really give honest feedback for growth when you don't want, when it's done publicly. I don't know. That's my feeling on it. I'm just being blunt, but. You can, but yours is the only one. Yours is the only one that's done publicly, right? That's correct. Uh, that's a valid concern. And I mean, I will just say that my private evaluations that I give to Darius, my public one is very complimentary and my private one is much more complimentary. So, <laughs> Right. But I mean, but, but the other side, you know, Peter, you and I have had conversations about just because public's watching, I don't want to make me go on, but we and I have had conversations about budget stuff. And you've had direct feedback to Shelly and I about what you'd like to see what you want for transparency and what you want the towns to know. Very something very solid that could be put in an evaluation, but red wrong could be look like we're not doing anything. You know what I mean? And so that's kind of what I'm saying. Like you've given us a lot of feedback. We've changed a lot of, you know, look at Shelley's report tonight, the, the in-depth of each, um, you know, of each of the uh, revolving accounts and that kind of stuff is what you asked for. That was not done two years ago. All right. Perfect. You know, that kind of stuff. And so it is a, an evaluation thing about communication and style, but, you know, you would have to put it in Darius who needs to improve, improve communication about blah, 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 sends a different message than enhancing communication. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's a, no, I'll, I'll back off because you're obviously. No, I'm just telling you, I, that's just how, that's what I'm saying. It makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> Keith? I'll just add to it. I, I agree with Peter. I think evaluation is important, but I also think that um, simple evaluations are really important. At this time of year, there shouldn't be any surprises. Um, and I think back to the old evaluation system with the three ring binders and all the different, and it was so, it, there was, it wasn't based on reality. I, I actually do appreciate kind of the, the simpler format there that you've kind of, that we've gone with right now. Um, but I do think it would be important. I mean, for us publicly by the end of the year to, you know, present some sort of evaluation or, or at least get the results and make that public as well. Yeah. Well, you have to actually, so we, we will. All right. Uh, in that case, uh, let's see. Any other? Uh, go ahead, Peter. 
Just want to report that uh, town meeting is scheduled for Saturday afternoon uh, out back of town hall or town offices at, uh, I believe it's 4 p.m. Um, bring a chair, bring an umbrella if it's a hot, sunny day. Um, you know, we've got uh, items specifically uh, impacting the school or obviously the general budget. Uh, the There's an article on the uh, capital budget that has the two items for the school uh, and then uh, the uh, there's an article on the money for the early childhood playground um, from uh, so that they're you know you need to pay attention make sure you're certainly voting for all of those but so far they've gotten complete support all the way through the process so um, hopefully the the final bit will come on Saturday so again it's good for us to be there and Darius, will you be there, or you got other stuff to do? Yeah. Great. Yeah. Great. Keith, I'm not going to be there. Well, I actually, I do. I, I, I really feel remiss if I miss it, but I do have a. Um, it's our training weekend. I'll be in Provincetown, so I can't make it back out. I like to. I was going to bring a new tire for your bike. <laughs> That's good. Oh uh, yeah, try not to scare half the crowd this year. Yeah, Keith. Keith was uh, Keith has been coming to sitting in on most of the select board meetings this year, and uh, he actually spoke up real uh, eloquently and forcefully about the need uh, at last week's meeting for the special education team leader, and um, you know the the burden that teachers were having to deal with to to get everything done that needs to be done, and so. Um, you know, I thought I was real impressed. I mean, Keith, that was great what you were saying because it really made the point. Indeed. All right. Uh, collaborative? Uh, they have a new director. Um, former superintendent, of our, the current superintendent from Ludlow, I believe. And then Todd the Costa. Yeah, and it was a really positive evaluation process. He seems really good, and um, they're just trying to balance their budgets now. Outstanding. All right, in that case, I think that takes us all the way to uh, a motion to adjourn. Um, Go ahead, Peter. I just, I don't know if I need, want to make this a motion, but I just want to just express uh, just my admiration and appreciation for every single person that works at the school um or you know works for the school at the central office for you know and this is from darius to the most part-time person and everyone included that uh for what they've done this year uh to keep the uh education going uh at our school uh to as large extent as they have it's if i look around to other schools in this area we've been in person just a huge amount more than some other places and um it you, you sort of you, you, I hope people don't take that for granted because it's just been a ton of work. And you heard Ben talking about just the work of the custodian. Okay. Of, you know, it's a big building. There are a lot of people in that building. And you look at, um, you know, other buildings in town, the town, town offices and the library. And, you know, they're, they're, you know, slowly and very carefully moving back to normal conditions. The school was, you know, in a situation where it had to do that a lot sooner and and with a lot more people involved. And and it's just been remarkable how good a job you all have done. So, um, you know, if, if someone could, I, I don't really have a motion in mind, but I just want to have it here on the, on the, uh, in the meeting saying how much, uh, I, I'm pretty sure the whole committee appreciates what you all have done. Outstanding. Thank you for that, Peter. Agree, 100%. I would echo that completely. Thank you. Perhaps we should have a motion, you know, just so I can put it in the minutes then to to just recognize the the outstanding work done by the uh, entire uh, uh, by everyone who works for the school. Okay, for making this year as uh, for dealing with the problems of, of, of this year and COVID as as well as they have done. It's just been amazing. So that'll be a motion. 
I'll, I'll second. second. Oh, go for it, Keith. I'll second. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Keith? Yes. Jessica? Oh, yes. Peter? Yes. Megan? Yes. Greg? Yes. Indeed. If, if this were the military, the the workers, the cafeteria workers who were nearby when the uh, steam thing went off would also get a special medal for sure. <laughs> That's very frightening. You want a motion to adjourn? We're so moved. Okay. Second? Second. Okay. Uh, Jessica? Yes. Keith? Yes. Megan? Yes. Peter? Yes. yes. Greg, yes. All right. Thank you all.